everybody, welcome into the Cubs Weekly Podcast, presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs Checking. Open online today at Wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. As a reminder, we're available on all podcast platforms, so be sure to rate and subscribe. Tony and Jackie here, joined by Andy Martinez. Andy, we're in sunny Arizona. Yep. I just got here. You've been covering the team yep. here for the last couple of weeks. Uh, first question that I think all the listeners at home want to know, too, is how is it going on your ankle? You tore a couple ligaments. You're on, yeah. You could have been on the 60-day IL, but you've been gutting your way through it, and you've been playing through injury. What's it been, what's it been like? Uh, it's been it's been tough. The, the ankle's a little swollen each and every day that I get home, but uh, no, it could be, could be worse. So uh, it's it's not too bad. Uh, learning to be, to be able to test my limits, and the cliche is always you show up in your best shape of your life. I, that was not the case for me this year, unfortunately. <laughs> but other than I'm that, still, you're in the best shape uh, of your other life. Other than that, yeah, yeah other absolutely. than that, I'm in the best shape of my life, and, and um, I'm glad to be here, and, and it's been fun covering the team along these, these two weeks for sure. All right, so here it is on Friday afternoon as we're sitting here. So the first game is tomorrow. Yep. So games are about to kick off. We saw yep. the lineup you tweeted out. It, it's basically, I think, how a lot of us thought the opening day lineup might look, again, yeah. with injuries and with everything else. Um, how, how? What are you looking forward to when games start, when they first kick off, especially with Marcus Stroman getting the ball in game one, and then just beyond that? I think the, the first thing I'm going to be looking at is the defense, right? We've heard so much about this offseason. The, the team is predicated on defense. The team is on building defense. It's all about defense and pitching. Well, you get the first-hand look in that first game, and we're going to be seeing it all year, right? Marcus Stroman, contact-oriented pitcher in game one. The defense of Nico Dansby, Cody Bellinger in center field, and then Jan Gomes behind the plate. That's kind of the spine you're going to be looking for throughout the season. Sometimes maybe Tucker Barnhart. If you want to give Nico a day off, maybe someone like Nick Madrigal or something like that. But – that's the spine of your defense. We want to see that that going early on. And and in the Cubs case, Dansby and Nico working together. We, they started working together in camp. What's it going to be like? What's it going to be like their routine working together, playing together, knowing their tendencies when the ball's hit? Just seeing them play together and gel together defensively is going to be something I'm going to be watching. Yeah, me too, for sure, because I, I think back to Dansby's initial press conference, mm-hmm. and he was saying that he's going to petition Rossi to let him play with Nico a bunch off the start too, yeah. to be able to have that – that combo and that, just that rapport up the middle. And everybody knew Nico was moving to second base. Dansby's taking over at shortstop. So the fact that they're both going to be out there for game one and and possibly, I mean, the way this lines up, right, like they'll probably be off then the next day, then they'll play the next day. like, yep. And they'll be out there for a couple innings at a time. As it lines up, they, they will likely probably be playing against each other or with each other, rather, uh, throughout the remainder of the spring. So that's what I'm looking at for sure. Like you said, it's the defense. And then I think, too, just like I'm curious to see who comes in after some of these starting pitchers. Yeah. And that fifth starter spot is up for grabs. Some of the bullpen, there's so many names out there that are up for grabs in the bullpen. But that's what I'm going to be watching is just how a lot of these guys, there's a lot of the non-roster guys that I don't know a ton about. I've, I've seen their baseball reference page or I've seen highlights, but I don't know a ton about them or how they may fit in the Cubs bullpen. So I think that's something that I'm going to be watching a ton is just like, where they they kind of finalize some of those pieces and then also to see like I'm pretty familiar I feel like with Brad Boxberger but then guys like Julian Merriweather I I don't know a ton I've never seen him pitch live like to see a little bit more of him and and to see how some of these other guys kind of fit around Brandon Hughes and Rowan Wick and some of those other guys in the bullpen yeah and Michael Fulmer's another guy right that I think he he has the potential to maybe get some high leverage innings maybe save some games maybe go for maybe get four or five outs the bullpen is a huge question. As you mentioned, there's so many names. There's so many in-house options, too. Jeremiah Stroud is one guy to look at, right? Probably some of the filthy stuff in the organization, especially yeah. from a homegrown pitcher. He could be that. And as David Ross mentioned, last year at this time, Brandon Hughes was not in camp, right? Yeah. He was not He was not in camp. And by the end of the season, he was probably their most go-to reliever, their, their highest leverage uh, reliever in the bullpen at the end of the season. There's going to be names that maybe appear in the seventh or eighth inning games early on that you might tend to overlook, but yeah. who knows? They might be pitching later on. And to that end, I remember talking to Brandon when I mentioned, I was like, oh, how was your offseason? I went up to him in the clubhouse that it's spring. I was like, how was your offseason? How was spring? He's like, this is kind of weird. I've never been in the major league <laughs> uh, clubhouse at spring training at Sloan Park. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. You weren't, you, you, you haven't been here. You, you've never been a non roster invitee. You've always been on the minor league side. And he's like, yeah, this is all new to me. This is. That, that, that just speaks to what, first of all, what the Cubs bullpen could be and what Jed Hoyer, Carter Hawkins, and the front office hope it can be one day, right, where they're developing homegrown arms and they're bringing them up and they're succeeding. But at the same time, it also brings into just you don't know what could happen through the course of 162 and some of these relievers that might be pitching in the 6th, in the 7th inning of, of, of games 
could maybe one day be pitching for the Cubs in the big leagues. Yeah, and I, I think that's just a really interesting point, too, of like guys that you didn't necessarily count on becoming yep. big factors for the team. And I think Christopher Morell was one of them as well last year. Like he was on the 40 man roster, so mm -hmm. he was. In, in big league camp, a little bit different than Brandon Hughes in that regard, but he wasn't a guy that people thought necessarily was yeah. going to come up mid-May and then stick around for the rest yeah. of the season and be an integral part of this lineup and playing center field and then all over the place once other guys got healthy. Uh, so where, as we're talking about position battles, Andy, where do you kind of see him fitting? Because with the addition of Edwin Rios, like the third base picture got a lot more cloudy. The other positions seem a little more solidified, certainly than last year's roster, but, but definitely a lot more veterans guys with big league experience you had Rios in the mix you already had Patrick Wisdom Nick Madrigal we know is moving to third base at least part-time and in the mix over there Zach McKinstry Miles Mastroboni are already over there yeah. as well so I mean we're talking like six names yeah. where does Morell fit into this and a guy who's only played 10 games at the at the AAA level could we maybe see him start the season this 23 year old start the season in the minors just f instead of being kind of a backup and not playing every day in the big leagues? I think that's a real possibility that he is starting in AAA at the beginning of the season. His struggles in the second half of, of the season were, were pretty pro profound, right? He hit 182 over the last two months. I believe it was 182 over the last two months of the season. He struggled to really get it going after his hot start. He, there's, It's not a, an end-of-the-world type of thing if that does happen. I think it would benefit him to be playing every day as opposed to, well, maybe he'll play in center today. And then maybe he'll sit the next two days with a with a pinch hit appearance. And then on that third day, maybe he'll play third base. I don't think it, it, it helps the Cubs. I don't think it helps Christopher Morrell if he's just a bench guy and not playing regularly as much as if he was playing in AAA. He can figure out what kind of went wrong with him in the second half, get back on track. If he plays really well, it, it, we've seen what he can do at the big league level. It would be hard to keep him down there. And it would be hard to not have him at the big league level if he's succeeding, if he's having offensive success like we, had, like we saw early on because – we saw what he could be where he was a really good major leaguer and one of the most exciting players on the Cubs those first two or two months or so that he was up in the big leagues. Yeah. And, and again, looking at all the other guys, like yeah. it's, it's a little hard to make the case for Morrell. And you and I were talking about this, like one of the cases might be the fact that he is probably or possibly the best backup center field option. Yeah. But I mean, Nelson Velasquez is out there as well. And there's some other non roster. Patrick invitees. Wisdom has played a little bit of center field. That's and true. You could theoretically move in half to center field and, and play, Wisdom or, or or Edwin Rios or Trey Mancini or someone in or in McKinstry's field, play or corner McKinstry. outfield yeah so there's there, there's some flexibility there in terms of what you want to do in center field maybe not ideal in a long term thing but in a pinch I think it it could work yeah and and I think the addition of Rios too I, I mean he's a he's a guy who's tantalized his potential a little bit with the Dodgers he's a left handed bat he has some pop as well and he's a little bit older I think he's 28 right so yeah. like he's a little bit further along in his career then you have Patrick Wisdom who has led the team in homers the last couple of years he's one of the bigger run producers we i don't think he'll lead the team this year in home runs right. but it's certainly possible like we know that power is legit we know that he brings a lot to the team he's one of, been one of their best stories over the last couple of years just in this organization so i mean he looks like a kind of a lock for a, a position right. a, a spot he dh first base as well as third base uh mckinstry doesn't have any minor league options and then nick madrigal i think he does have a minor league option still yeah. but like he's a guy that you look at this bench, and and you've we've talked about this too. Like David Ross has already mentioned that he likes having guys with different skill sets. So you yeah. have maybe power in Edwin Rios or left hand bat in Rios and McKinstry, and then you have contact in Nick Madrigal, yeah. and then you also probably want to have a, a guy that you feel comfortable with at second base yeah. to give Nico a day off to have maybe give Dansby a day off, although he's barely taking any days. Maybe off Maybe he does career. a DH day or something. As, exactly, a half day <laughs> off. Um, but you know, so Madrigal could certainly slot over there. But like you look at these guys, and, and it does seem to be a little bit harder fit for Morel, yeah. just because I think some of these other guys check a different box that Morel maybe doesn't, um, that that would give them a little more precedent to, to make the opening day roster. And, and I think the important thing too is you, you don't want to stall his development, right? If you're If he's not playing all the time, if he's just sitting on the bench and playing every second day, every third day, worst case scenario, every fourth, fifth day, yeah. And he's only getting pitch hit appearances every here and there. It doesn't help him grow as a player. And we see the potential he can have. We saw it those first two months. That first that bad at Wrigley Field where he had a yeah. home run. He had a clutch sacrifice fly against the Cardinals. Like th th There's just so many things that you want him to continue to, to improve on because you can see what he can do. But he doesn't do that if he's not playing regularly. And, and he's if he's working if, – if he can be playing every single day, working through mistakes – improving on on his game and and maybe fine-tuning each and every position because there was 
he wasn't the greatest center fielder, but he could play the center field. Maybe get a few more reps there. Get a few more reps at third base. Get a few more reps at second base and still play every day. I think that just that just benefits him and it benefits the Cubs long term organizationally. Yeah, I think your point is dead on. Like you don't want to disrupt his development because yep. he is 23. And, you know, as David Ross even spoke about this week, like he's a huge part of their team's future. Yep. And guys like Cody Bellinger, Eric Hosmer, Trey Mancini are here for one or two years right yep. now. And, and, you know, who knows about the future beyond some of these guys, you know, are, are pushing closer to 30 or over 30, especially when you include like Wisdom or even Rios or McKinstry in that mix as well. So Morell's younger. He definitely has a bright future. Um, all we're kind of saying is we're just not 100% sure unless there's injuries or some other things that happen over the next yep. four or five weeks. Yep. We're not entirely sure that that's going to happen from opening day. But again, you know, things things happen unpredictably all the time. Yeah. We didn't think Morell and Brandon Hughes would come up and be here to stay from like May 17th on last year. Right. So so definitely uh, a lot to watch. That is going to be something, though, I watch throughout spring is basically where Morell fits and then where the third base position shakes out that like we said that's really kind of one of the only things that is still has a lot of question marks yep. at least of the position player group but Edwin Rios we, we touched on him a little bit you got a chance to meet him and, and see him in camp he was a little bit of a late arrival just because the signing happened after camp already started but what's your first impression Ben how do you think he can fit with this team so far I think it's it's real power but it's a real power bat he had a home run uh in at live BP earlier this week I think uh, Dustin Kelly said it was already his third in, in less than a week of, of live VP. And live VP, too, you know, we talk about home runs in, in, in live VP, and you're kind of like, oh, whatever, it's just live VP. Yeah. But both Dustin Kelly and David Ross have said it's not easy to hit in live VP. It's hard to kind of get amped up for facing one of your teammates to be to, with no crowd interaction, and you're just swinging and then going back. And the, you're the just pitchers, starting out. Like yes. this is some of the first live pitching you're exactly. seeing in months. Probably. Exactly. You're like you can you can replicate it as all you want with with machines and things like that. But to see the actual the funkiness of the motion or or, or where the ball is getting released, that you can't duplicate that with a machine. And it, and in their case, like the. It's the first time they're seeing live pitching where they might be working on stuff. You might see a guy who's only throwing cutters because he's trying to fine tune his cutter. Like for yeah. for example, like there, there's things like that that you see that you're that's just not normal in a game setting, right? You're not going to see five six cutters in a row. It, just the mental aspect of live VP isn't the best. So for Edwin Rios to be doing that, I mean that 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 uh, I think it shows to what he can be a, as a power bat. And in LA, we saw it with McKinstry a little bit. We've seen it time and time again where. They're just so talented and so yeah. deep with talent that it can get so easy to get blocked, right? When you have Trey Turner at shortstop and Justin Turner at third base, it's tough to break into the team and just to get regular at-bats. He struggled with health, and then he could never really get it going. That It kind of helped the Cubs in a lot of ways, and now Jed Hoyer and the Cubs are hoping that, hey, the, the fact that the, Cubs, that the Dodgers are so deep and talented – could benefit the Cubs because they may they might have been able to get a really talented player. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously that's a few guys now, all three lefty bats yeah. with Bellinger and then McKinstry as well. Yeah. In some regards, I think McKinstry is one of the kind of forgotten men of, yeah. on this group, a, a guy on the roster, because when the Cubs acquired him last year for in that Chris Martin deal, uh, he was a big league ready guy. Like we yeah. saw Hayden Wesneski come from the Scott Efros deal and stuff. But other than that, like the fruits of those trades have not really reached the big leagues. McKinstry has been here since day yeah. one, since that trade. And this is a guy that had a lot of potential. Like he was well liked uh, by a lot of prospect evaluators. He hit 335 with like a 400 plus on base percentage yeah. in Triple A last season as well. Like he has he has a, a skill set where. Um, you know, he has a good hit tool. He has a decent amount of pop, a decent amount of speed. He can play all over the place, a lefty bat. Like, even though he has no minor league options, like, he's been a guy that, again, I think has been a little more under the radar, flying under the radar in this team. Yeah. I'm really curious to see his fit. So, like, as we talk about things for watching the game, I'm just curious to see, like, how he plays, like, what his fit might be on the team. It, I don't know exactly. Like, before this offseason, before Miles Mastroboni and, so, and Edwin Rios and some of these other moves, I would have thought, like, Wisdom and McKinstry at third base, at that duo, that platoon, would have made a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, because there's so many guys in the mix, because Madrigal's over there, et cetera, like, it – it's not as clear cut. So I'm going to be seeing what they do. They obviously like McKinstry. They, yep. they liked him enough to trade for him and then keep him on the 40 man roster all year, all winter as well. So definitely curious there, but you know, we talked about magical a bit as well. What have you seen from him in the little bit of drills that he's done at third base? And, and how do you think that fit might work out with him playing a position that he's essentially never played until the spring? Yeah. So I talked to him a little bit and there'll be more coming on marquee sports but he told me pretty early on in the off season, they kind of, told him like 
we we want you to start getting reps at third base. We want you to start playing third base because our our plan and again this is early in the offseason. Their plan was they were in the shortstop market, and if they got one of those shortstop, that was going to move Nico to second. The opening was going to be at third, and Magic if for, if they wanted to keep Magical in the lineup or keep his bat in the lineup, third base was was the spot for him. Early on, he started getting reps in at third base in, in the offseason so he can get used to it, and. I was probably one of the ones who was like, well, third base, he's just not the prototypical third baseman. It's, it's you, 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 you don't see him and then just scream, oh, yeah, that's a third baseman. Yeah. But he mentioned one of the things he was working on was long toss, playing a lot more long toss so he can increase that arm strength. And so far early on in camp, and, and it's fair to say, you know, it's only drills. It's only, it's only you know, Andy Green hitting fungos. But there's been – Andy Green, we saw what he did with Frank Schwindel at playing at first base where he came up and hit well early on in, in, in 21 – but the defense wasn't there, and as the as the second half of 21 progressed, Frank Schwindel improved a lot defensively at first base. Nico Horner has credited a lot of his defensive yeah. work with Andy Green. He's been working a lot with Andy Green. Madrigal has at, at third base, and he's mentioned he's been getting in early. He's been doing extra works to get the reps in at third base. You can't mimic the game situation by any means playing at at, at or just taking ground balls from from Andy Green in in drills. But from what we have seen. It's it, 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 he can play third base. You know, it's it's again. It's still there's still some plays where you're like, yep, he's still trying to figure it out. There's still some drills where you're like, there's some things he's got to work on. But for right now, where he's at, I think it's really impressive where he's come to be at in in terms of the third base position and learning it and playing it every single day. Yeah, and it's unrealistic to ever expect him to have an arm like Patrick Wisdom right. or Christopher Morel, but to be out there and to be serviceable, especially without shifts. Like he won't necessarily have to be playing like the shortstop position, which we saw. I, I remember being struck by when wisdom first came up in 21, he was playing third base, but because of the shift, he was essentially playing, playing that shortstop. shortstop. Yep. How many plays did he make ranging to his right where yeah. he kind of threw across his body and he showed off that impressive arm strength, but just in general, like there was a lot of athletic plays out there, but to be honest, when I saw Madrigal, I had seen him play a few times live and then obviously on TV a bunch uh, when he was with the White Sox. But then early last season, I thought like, wow, this guy's actually doing pretty good at second base. Like, And I, I ne- he was never a bad defender or anything right. like that, but I, he was even a little bit better than I thought yeah. or than I remembered from his days of the White Sox. He was quick turns. Like, again, the arm strength, you know, like I, I think it's in a little bit of lower percentiles among uh, stat cast and stuff like that. But still, like, he was pretty quick out there. He was athletic. He had pretty good range at second base. He passed the eye test, yep. at least in my thought. So third base, obviously quite a bit different, but I am curious to see how – I just think he's another guy that makes no sense. Kind of like the McKintree thing, it makes no sense for the Cubs to to give up on him right, right. now. They gave up Craig Kimbrell for him. They they obviously targeted him and Cody Hoyer, two guys who who could play a huge impact, uh, you know, down the stretch for this team. But like you know, 25, 26 years old, the former top prospect, number four overall pick, like why give up on him right, right now? Last year was marred by injury. Really, his whole career to this point in the big leagues has been marred by injury. But like it you owe it to yourselves to see what you have in him. Yep. Even if that's at kind of an odd fit at third base, I think you just owe it to yourself to, to take that shot. And to that point with the injuries, you know, talking to some people in the organization, there was some some lower half, the lower half of the body, his strength there, wasn't it wasn't his strength there. And one of the things they targeted with the full offseason, because to remember, this, was, this is his first full offseason with the Cubs. Sure, technically it was the 2021-2022 offseason, but there was a lockout. So he had three months or so, two months or so, where he was not in communication with the Cubs. He had a whole offseason with the Cubs. He lives in, in the Phoenix area, so he was at the Cubs facility all winter. He was working on things, and he mentioned that his lower half wasn't as strong as it, it, it should have been. And he feels like he's in, he's in a lot better shape. He mentioned he was trying to impress a lot last season, right? You get it traded for a new yeah. team. Like you mentioned for Craig Kimbrell, you go to a new team, you have new teammates, you want to show off what you can do and who you can be. That now he realizes it does no good to try and over push it and get hurt. Now he can be fully his full health self. And I think when he is that, we saw what it was in the second half where he was hitting like 287. That's just a skill set, like we mentioned off the bat, that could that could totally help David Ross. He mentioned it specifically, right? We, you know, if you need if you want to break open an inning, you maybe go to a power bat. But if you have a runner on third and less than two outs, you want a contact bat. And to me, that that just immediately screamed of Nick Madrigal. Yeah, right. Even if he's not starting, like just coming yeah. off the bench and his ability to hit velocity throughout his career is also certainly helpful, yeah. especially in the later innings. But we're gonna take a quick break here in the Cubs Weekly Podcast. When we come back, we're gonna talk a little Kyle Hendricks and Cody Bellinger. Get 
your WinTrust exclusive debit card, get your Cubs card. Ooh, I'll take one, how much? Actually, they pay you $300. You heard right. Get a $300 bonus when you open a Cubs checking account with WinTrust. Enjoy all perks and purchase with pride every time with your WinTrust Cubs debit card. $300? Wait, what? I'll take a $300. $300? Get your exclusive card at WinTrust.com slash Cubs. Only $100 required to open. No monthly minimum balance and no monthly maintenance fees. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. All right, we're back here on the Cubs Weekly Podcast. So, Andy, we were talking about hitters a bit, and we were talking about some guys who are trying to fulfill their potential, guys like Nick Madrigal or Zach McKinstry or others. What about Cody Bellinger? This is a guy who, rookie of the year, MVP winner, last couple of years have really not gone the way that his, the first yeah. few years of his career did where, I mean, he was on this Hall of Fame trajectory, and that's yeah. not even being facetious no, or, or uh, yeah. you know, like, making too much of it like certainly he was on a hall of fame trajectory for the first three years so the cubs took a flyer on him another former dodger hitter what have you seen so far out of camp i know he had an impressive home run again back to live bp off of drew smiley so lefty on lefty but still like just what have you seen from bellinger and what have what makes you think that like he could turn things around this year with the cubs the first thing i saw was just like the relaxed aura around him right like This is a guy that, again, you mentioned all the credentials that he has. Then two tough seasons, you would think he'd be stressed, worried, like, you know, I got to get this right because I'm on a one-year prove-it deal and I need to, uh, uh, you know, I need to have success in order if I want to get another contract, whatever. It just doesn't seem like that. Like, it seems like he's very loose. And it helps when he's got a comfortable environment, right, where Johnny Washington, assistant assistant hitting coach, Dustin Kelly, hitting coach, both came from the Dodgers organization or have been in the Dodgers or- organization. There's some familiarity there. Dustin Kelly mentioned that day one. So, so Cody Bellinger signed in in December. The next day he's at the Cubs facility. Dustin Kelly and him hit it off right away. They mentioned they were speaking. They both said that they're speaking the same language. They speak the same language. What, uh, what, what that means exactly, I'm not sure, but they obviously hit it off right away from day one. They're doing really well. Like that, just the, the environment where they're creating, it, it, it's helping Cody Bellinger kind of gain some confidence. And, and that's not to be overlooked, right? When you have, when you had all that success, and then you have some struggle, getting confidence, getting that mental uh, assurance that you're that what you're doing is working is huge. And and he saw that earlier in the week, or earlier in the first week of camp, where he hits a lefty on lefty home run off Drew Smiley to left center field at Sloan Park and it was a, it was a no doubt home run it was it was a nice swing got a good piece on, uh, on the cutter that that Drew Smiley hit through that those are the winning confident moments that going back again live bp not the greatest situation but it's a tough situation to hit and so for him to do that well, I thought was really important and, and and I think it gives him confidence to continue to work that what he's working on is actually finding success and for the cubs sake they're not hoping that they're, they sure they hope that they get the MVP level back, right? But that's not what they're banking on, right? If he becomes kind of what he was in 17 and 18, where he was one of the one of the better hitters in the league, if the Cubs would take them. That would be an amazing boon to the to the offense that that is much needed, especially from the left-handed side. Yeah, and I think too, just the fact that that Homer was lefty lefty. Yeah, I think that's big because we haven't even heard specifically like about whether he's going to play against lefties or it's going to be more a platoon role or right. what exactly like the Cubs envision. It's a little different than like when Jack Peterson came in. That was a huge talking point from Peterson himself that yeah. he wanted an opportunity to play against lefties, show what he could do. The Cubs were granting him that opportunity. By all accounts, it seems like they're grant going to grant Bellinger the same opportunity yeah. because they just again go. Going back to the Morrell conversation, they don't really have a great right-handed option for center field unless it's Morrell. And again, Morrell in a platoon role doesn't make a ton of sense for the team. It probably makes more sense in AAA. So outside of that, unless they want to pair him with Nelson Velasquez in center, he only played center you know, a handful of times last year as well. Um, I, I think it sure seems like Bellinger is probably going to get a decent amount of starts against lefties and really just a long runway to see what he can do. So it's encouraging that early in spring training, he's hitting a homer. He's showing some power. He's getting good looks off of a lefty, uh, even if it is his own teammate yeah. in this regard. But yeah, I think, I think you know, again, going back to things we're going to be watching is I'm just, I'm just curious to learn more about Bellinger. And I didn't watch enough of his last few years to understand where things went wrong. And obviously the refrain that I always go back to that I love that David Ross uses a lot is like, well, what happened with this guy? And it's like, well, you know, like where he's struggling. It's like, well, if we knew that, don't you think we would have fixed it? It's like, yeah, of course. Like if Bellinger knew exactly what was going wrong, 
then I'm sure he would have fixed it. Now, maybe the, the, the hindsight you know, of the offseason is much easier to, to look at that, the fact that he is fully healthy after dealing with a shoulder injury, you know, stemming from 2020. Like, that certainly helps too. But just, like, how he goes about it, just the, the fresh freshness, so to speak, of, like, a change of scenery can certainly help. And I'm curious to see how it plays for Bellinger. Yeah, it'll be one of the storylines of the season, really, what he can do, what he can play in center field. And – I think at the very least what the Cubs knew they're getting and what they're clearly getting is a boon to their defense because defensively he was, he's was he been stellar amidst his struggles. He's been a great defensive center fielder. He won a gold glove in right field. Like He can really boost the defense up the middle, like we mentioned with Dansby and Nico in the infield and then Tucker Barnhart and Jan Gomes behind the plate. That spine that Jed Hoyer has alluded to in the offseason – Having Cody Bellinger there, along with Ian Happ in left field, and I think an improving Say Suzuki in right field gives them a really good defense that can will steal a lot of outs for the Cubs pitching staff. We're gonna have to get like instead of a swear jar, like a dollar for every time we talk about the spine of the defense. Yes, yes. Just because it's such a huge part, especially yeah. adding Barnhart, yeah. Bellinger, and Dansby this year, um, and it's really what the Cubs have <laughs> built their 2023 team yep. on. So, but you know, speaking of. Um, spine and speaking of your ankle injury yeah. before uh Kyle Hendricks is a guy coming back from injury and we don't expect to see him in April he certainly is not going to be on an opening day roster uh but he got to throw a bullpen and then chatted with you guys here uh earlier in this week I think it was on Friday right so yeah. uh can you just talk a little bit about what you saw from him how different maybe his mechanics look and, and what he seemed like here yeah it was a very quick bullpen it was about 10 to 15 pitches if that I think probably 10 to 12 closer to it the big thing was the the first of all him getting on the mound. He said it was the first time he had gotten on the mound since that injury in July uh, in Milwaukee, right, where he came out after three four innings, and that was the first time on the mound. And he said, you know, it's only been like seven months, but who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> so it was a funny joke from him. He was excited to get back on the mound. Jan Gomes was set up in front of the plate, so and and he wasn't throwing full max effort throws. You can tell, but he's been working amidst his injury. He's been working on shortening up his arm path so if, you, if you're watching on video you, you'll see it kind of a little bit better as I'm doing it but if you're listening you, I'll, I'll explain it too what he was mentioning was it, as in his delivery his arm was going straight back to where it was almost a straight line from his from his shoulder all the way to his arm and then he was coming back into his delivery a full circle motion but the arm was extending all the way back out which was not what he was when he was successful, that's not what he was doing. So he's been working a lot with with different, uh, I'm blanking on the term, but they're, they're balls that he puts in the different spots, or either like up against his neck or yeah. up against his, his, his uh, torso area to fine tune that mechanic path. And one of the guys that- Where like if the ball falls out, then it, he knows that he exactly. pulled off or something. Yeah, that, okay. that the motion is not right. Like the ball, he knows when the ball is supposed to fall. And if it's falling too early or if it's falling too fast, then the, the motion is not correct. One of the guys he leaned on in that situation was Jamison Tyon because Tyon early in his career was also fixing the arm path, was also working on fine-tuning the arm path, and he mentioned, like, it's not it's not like an overnight thing. You just have to keep going at it. You have to keep going at it. And he said early on that first, that first bullpen he threw, the movement was there, the arm path was there, and at least seeing it from the side angle where we were standing – you could definitely see the arm path was was shorter and more refined, and we t- we we talked to him after after the media scrum and we were showing him video of his old self. He's like, yeah, yeah, that was wrong. Like the arm was too far extended. Now it's a shorter arm path, which is allowing him to be more 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 fine with his pitching and 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 be more successful overall as a pitcher, which is what he has to be when he's not necessarily sitting 95, 97. Yeah, and I mean, it's really interesting to at 32, you know, almost 33, yeah. to be like remaking yourself in that regard. But really, pitchers have to do that all the time. I yeah. mean, we saw Adam Wainwright do it here in Chicago. John Lester remade himself. He, when when your velocity drops, and then Kyle Hendricks didn't have, like you said, a ton of velocity even to start with. Uh, anything you can do to, you know, have more separation between his best pitch change up and then you know his sinker or fastball, like then you need that and so anything you can do but then also like to be healthy like this is the first like real big injury of his career and it's a capsular tear in his shoulder I mean and it's something that like I think he said like about a third of the time or like 30 percent of the time the pitchers who require like actually have surgery and in some cases especially guys at his age with the mileage on his arm like it could be almost a career ender like certainly shoulder injuries can be for a lot of guys so uh yeah I think it's you know it's super interesting that he's doing that but really he's a guy that I just I put a lot of faith in because he's already 
done a done a lot with a little so to speak yeah. and just meaning the, the stuff and the velocity right and like he was never on top prospect rankings and he still come up and you know has been consistent up until the last couple of years so once he's back once he's healthy he's a guy that i i fully expect to kind of jump back into it but i'm just really curious to see what these changes like and how they affect him out there as well um and i mean i imagine like what kind of boost that is to the cubs pitching staff and rotation in may or so when he comes back like if he can be the guy that he was himself or the guy that even in 2021 where he started out a little slow he was still in the all-star discussion like as a possibility to represent the Cubs so I like having that in in the middle of the rotation after whoever this fifth starter is like I think that would be huge yeah and and two we mentioned we've talked about it plenty of times where yes you might have your starting five rotation once the season starts but you're going to need more than that right there's going to be injuries that happen there's going to be guys that struggle there's going to be funky days in the schedule where you might need that that spot starter six starter when you have that depth and and to think like right now Kyle Hendricks is like sixth or seventh option like yeah. that's that that means you're a pre, it's a pretty good sign for where the pitching staff and the rotation stands especially given the given the last year or two yeah so before we wrap up here Andy I'm curious we've talked about a lot of the known names or the um the guy the guys that we know a lot more about right like even guy like edwin rios who are some of the kind of under the radar guys that you've seen so far in the first 10 days or so of camp right before games kick off here that you think could have a shot to either make the opening day roster or play a role for this team at some point in 2023 i'll start with the pitching side rowan is elias i think is the guy i'm keeping an eye on lefty had a really really good dominican winter league season made seven starts i believe it was 36 or 39 innings and it is 0.92 era He's a very interesting guy in the sense that he's uh, he's got some he had some real stuff playing in the Dominican Winter League from the left-handed side. I think he's a guy that maybe could make some spot starts theoretically for the Cubs, but I think he could be kind of in that Keegan Thompson, Adbert Alzali, Justin Steele back in 21 role where he could pitch he could get multiple outs if needed. I think it's a very interesting signing, and I think he also again an NRI guy. He's going to be pitching in for Cuba in the World Baseball Classic, so he's getting stretched out because Cuba wants to use him as a starter. It's also a big thing for him because Cuba has never had Major League Baseball players in in their roster for the WBC, so it'll be the first time a Major League player will be representing Cuba. And for, for him, he mentioned, he talked to me and he, he told me how special that is and how special it was for his family. But I think he's a very interesting case that I think he could be getting outs, pitching big innings for, for the Cubs in, in 2023. And then on the offensive side, Mike Talkman. I, I mean, I think he is a really, really interesting guy. Had a really good season in Korea. Palatine native. Palatine too, from native. Illinois, yeah. I believe he, his OPS in, in Korea was just under 800. It's a very interesting case because, again, a left-handed bat could play pretty good defense. I, I think that's an interesting name to keep an eye on that could, again, we, we, we don't know how things shake out with injuries or with – with performance that he could be playing for the Cubs at some point. Ben Deluzio is another guy that, that's been pretty interesting because he's looked really good defensively out, out in the outfield. Very speed, speedy guy, made his major league debut with the Cardinals last year. So those are those are two or three names that I'm, I'm keeping an, a close eye on this this spring. Yeah, and I mean, Talkman and Elias both like fit different needs for yeah. the Cubs, right, in terms of a, another lefty reliever. They don't have a guy specifically mm-hmm. on the roster right now, and the 40-man roster at least that could, you know, pair with Brandon Hughes as another yep. left-handed reliever so that option and then yeah another left-handed bat like we talked about it all winter they've obviously added a bunch with yeah. Bellinger with Edwin Rios now with uh, McKinstry even last year Eric Hosmer so they have some other options Tucker Barnhart obviously as well they have other options but then you know Talkman to be out there you could play all three outfield spots mm-hmm. another left-handed option I, I think it presents a lot of options and I just think too he he played pretty well. He's already shown he can do it in the big leagues. He he had a nice stretch with the Yankees uh, a few years ago where yep. he showed off his power, his defense as well. So uh, certainly some interesting guys to keep an eye out for those of you at home watching games on Marquee Sports Network. We're going to be airing almost all throughout spring training, so keep an eye out first on Saturday and Sunday here. Um, but stay tuned to MarqueeSportsNetwork.com. You can get the full spring training schedule and then follow us along on the Cubs Weekly Podcast each week. That'll do it for this edition of the podcast. For Andy, I'm Tony. We thank you for listening. And again, as always, we are sponsored by Wintrust. We appreciate any rating and subscribing you do. So thanks for tuning in.